So thanks really for the kind uh, remarks uh, introducing our areas of interest uh, and, and that's where we'll be uh, focusing. And so just to get um, going on the same page, um, we've thought a lot for quite some years now um, about lymphoid tissue organization and function, really going back to when I started at UCSF in 1995. Um, and at that time, there's really very little understood about how the organization occurred. It was known that they had this nice organization. And this slide is highlighting a similar organization of the white pulp of the spleen, lymph node, mucosal lymphoid tissue with T cell rich areas and B cell rich follicles. But very little was known about the cues involved. And so, just to, you know, very quick recap we, we were um, involved in establishing CXO13 as guiding B cells to follicles. And, and, and we and, and a number of other groups showed the importance of CCI7 and its ligands in the T zone. And then um, we uh, were able to show an important role for sphingosine 1 phosphate as a critical uh, egress uh, cue uh, driving responses through this chemoattractant receptor S1PR1. And this, this really uh, surprisingly simple lipid critical for that process. I know the margin zone uh, is of interest to a number of B cell biologists uh, at, at your institute. And we showed some years ago that another role of this S1P, S1PR1 system is to help position cells in this blood exposed compartment. And we'll be talking more about the marginal zone uh, a bit later. Um, we uh, contributed to characterizing this chemoattractant receptor, EBI2 or GPR183, and worked with Novartis to, to establish that this dihydroxy cholesterol, uh, this, this oxysterol, is a potent ligand and contributes, for example, to positioning cells in these interfollicular uh, regions, such as the dendritic cells and activated B cells. We have um, shown important requirements for B cell access to the subepithelial region of the Paz patch and its role in IgA. And, and we've been building on this uh, work recently, as I'll talk about uh, in a moment. And then we've also had a long standing interest in the germinal center, really the, the sort of crucible of, of um, B cell biology in terms of the diversification and selection processes, and that this structure forms inside lymphoid follicles. And, and of course, we know many important things happen in there, but, but it has to be organized to do them effectively. And we showed some years ago, CXCO12, is organizing it into dark and light zones. And then the, another role for sphingosine one phosphate, so this pleiotropic uh, actions it has is through a different S1P receptor that's not chemoattractive, but rather migration inhibitory. And this red line is to indicate a, a confinement promoting role that it has it, for the germinal center. But I'm not going to, uh, to, to get into that today, but um, rather focus on, on three topics if, if we, we get through that. Um, first, uh, our, some new findings regarding requirements for IgA responses uh, in Paz patches and, and the gut. Uh, and then uh, we've returned to the, the marginal zone uh, question. How is this compartment organized to support rapid responses to bloodborne pathogens? And then um, recently uh, in, in a postdoc um, that's joint with uh, a couple other labs actually, We've pursued our interest in, in G protein coupled receptors to, into the direction of the actual G protein subunits. And that's led to some, I think, interesting findings regarding myeloid cell uh, phagocytic requirements. So, getting into the first section so, um, IgA responses, I think we all know uh, are the major responses of the B cells at mucosal surfaces and certainly the gut, that is very much the case contributes to protection from enteric pathogens, but also shapes the microbiome. And the Paz patches, of which there are some hundred or so in humans, um, are the, the major site of intestinal IgA uh, induction. And you can see, of course, these patches that I'm sure many of you have looked at uh, along the intestine. And if you cut into one, you can see the epithelium, it's sort of collapsed together here, but beneath that uh, specialized follicle associated epithelium, is a C11C rich subepithelial dome, as it's called, uh, overlying the B cell follicle within which there will often be germinal center responses to microbiome or, or intestinal derived material. And so some years ago, um, when Andrea Riboldi was in the lab, uh, and he now has his own lab at UMass, uh, we, we made these findings regarding uh, requirements for induction of IgA switch, and that was that B cells would uh, be migrating into that subepithelial dome 
in a CCI6-dependent manner. So this chemotractant receptor responds to CCL20 that's made by follicle-associated epithelium. And so that organizing logic is then used to promote encounters with a specialized subset of dendritic cells, these conventional dendritic cell type 2, that we um, were able to show have this integrin alpha V beta 8. Uh, and that is known to be able to activate TGF beta, uh, which is a key, uh, already known to be a key IGA switch factor. And just to show you those interactions, the dendritic cells here in red, some B cells in green, in the subepithelial dome in a living pairs patch. And you can see these interactions can go on for many minutes uh, between the B cell uh, and the dendritic cell. Uh, in this zone with this signal presumably taking place. And then this initiates the class switch process, but then the B cell will return to the follicle and potentially participate in the germinal center and give outputs of plasma cells that can then home to the lamina propria uh, and secrete IgA. Now, uh, there's been a lot of components to this to study. And in fact, Andrea has been doing beautiful work in his own lab on some of the additional requirements for IgA class switching. And I actually kept uh, out of the area for a while. He left some time ago to, to really give him space to develop his projects. But but we um, it, it's been a while and we've come back to it, uh, partly uh, indirectly, as we didn't quite start there, but but our knowledge here led us back to this interesting question. And and this was the CCR6 got the B cells here, but but the dendritic cells actually didn't depend on it to be there. And so you've got this sort of simple question of how do these zones, these complex niches organize, uh, and apparently more than one type of Q can be contributing to getting cells to the same region. And so what, what was going on for the dendritic cells? And as I said, we didn't come straight to that. We, we were actually looking um, at this receptor for its expression in dendritic cells, but, but in the spleen was where we were looking at the time for questions we had about spleen CDC2 positioning to support T follicular helper cell induction. And you can see here in just ImGen data that this receptor was particularly abundant in um, the CD4 positive DCs, which are the CDC2s. Uh, and, and it was known to be able to couple to several different G proteins, but included among them G alpha I, which is usually an indication it should be able to support migration, pro-migratory capacity. But it wasn't clear how it would work given these multiple couplings. And then also importantly, a group at Amgen some time ago had shown that kynorinic acid, a tryptophan metabolite, could function as a GPA35 ligand. So that was an important tool to be able to, to study this. Um, but then when we looked in GPI-35 deficient mice that we got from one of the um, repositories, uh, we didn't see any effect on the splenic CDC2 distribution or number. Uh, so, you know, this additional hypothesis wasn't supported for the spleen. And it sat there for some time. But then when Marco De Giovanni uh, joined the lab, and he um, recently finished up and is now starting his own lab uh, in Milan back in Italy, but but we we paid attention to this uh, actually stronger expression in granulocytes, neutrophils, uh, from the uh, thioglycolate inflamed peritoneum. And we said, you know, can we see an action here? And maybe that'll lead us back to understanding more about the cells that we have a stronger interest in, which is the requirements for the B cell T flicker helper cell response. And so I'm just going to summarize a couple of studies to then lead back to, to actually getting back to the B cell response with this biology. And what Marco um, was able to show was that GBI35 is contributing to neutrophil recruitment to sites of inflammation, such as the inflamed peritoneum. Uh, and he would see uh, in knockout somewhat less efficient clearance of bacteria. Uh, and then in the course of this work, we found that um, that kynorinic acid was unlikely to be the physiological ligand. And rather, we obtained evidence that serum and activated platelets were producing bioactivity on the receptor. And platelets were known to store large amounts of serotonin, and that can be metabolized to fibrodroxyndolacetic acid. Serotonin was not active on the receptor, even though it's, it's a tryptophan metabolite as well. But, but this breakdown product had activity in our assays. Uh, and so, this um, led us to this composite uh, model where we have platelets releasing when they, well, in, inside of inflammation, it's well known and we could readily confirm that activated platelets accumulate on the inflamed endothelium. And activated platelets release many mediators, including serotonin and its breakdown product, 5-HIA, 
which our data is indicating is acting on GPI-35 and contributing to the adhesive and pro-migratory uh, events here. And in mast cells, which are proximal to endothelium quite often, um, are also getting activated at sites of inflammation and releasing granules. And they also can release serotonin and uh, the metabolite 5-HIA. And from the best we could resolve, these two sources seem to cooperate to promote GPI-35 dependent neutrophil recruitment. And then in a um, sort of follow-up study to, to that that uh, was last year, just uh, I guess still 2023, we uh, this year found that eosinophils also upregulate GPI-35 and they it was contributing to their recruitment to um, the fungal infection in the lung, cryptococcal neoformans uh, infection. And here, actually, this is having a negative effect because eosinophils and the type 2 response that they sort of amplify is not helpful in clearing cryptococcus and you have more CFU. So uh, somehow the, the, the fungus is, is driving a type 2 response to benefit its growth and this receptor is, is involved. So, so with that background, um, we uh, were still thinking, of course, about the roles of this receptor, in particular, potentially in dendritic cells. And this nice data set came out during our work from Remnick Xavier's group, uh, showing in Payer's patches, just like in the spleen, that GPI-35 is well expressed in CDC2. Um, it's also in some other uh, types of myeloid cells, such as these lysosome positive DCs uh, and macrophages uh, in the Payer's patch, so we keep that in mind. But you can see that these Um, we looked at the CDC2 compartment in the Payer's patch uh, of mice that lacked GPI-35 down here. And we could see there was only a slight reduction in the total, but a bigger reduction in the C11B positive uh, CDC2 fraction. And that was quantitated across a series of mice, uh, whereas the CDC1 were not quantitatively affected in the Payer's patches. We made bone marrow chimeras, and that showed that this function, uh, its role is cell is bone marrow intrinsic and presumably CDC intrinsic, and mixed chimeras supported that. Uh, whereas these lice DC and lice MAC that I just showed you in the single cell seq data have expression, but their homeostasis was not affected. Uh, and so, in a migration assay with Payer's patch CDC two, which is not easy to do as their numbers are, are low, um, but we could see that there was some pro-migratory effect of this serotonin metabolite um, in the wild type, but not uh, in the GPI-35 uh, deficient sorry, uh, cells here. So we suggest then, or we, we would hypothesizing that it can be contributing to positional effects of these CDCs. And we used a whole mount approach um, to visualize the subepithelial dome through the epithelium in explants, but with two photon uh, microscopy and um, complicated imaging, but this is sort of the overall uh, image. And then Marco has gated in to uh, highlight the CDC in, in the wild type. This is, I should have said, a mixed chimeric setting uh, versus the mutant ones. And we, it's, you can see that maybe there's a spatial effect here, but the, the clearer result was that there was underrepresentation of the blue mutant compared to the wild type. BST2 is staining those lice, uh, DC lice MAC um, that are in the same region. And so we could get this small but reproducible uh, effect of a decreased representation of the CDC2 uh, when, the, when there was GPI-35 deficiency. So then the question was, um, <clears throat> does that reflect a pro-migratory uh, role and we can see this promotory capability in vitro. So we use a, a gain of function approach, put the receptor in a cell type that doesn't normally have it, and see if that could be sufficient to, to guide them into the subepithelial dome where the CDC2s uh, are normally enriched. And so what we're seeing is putting in the empty vector in, in, into some cells uh, and looking at their distribution in the, in the Payer's patch, the follicle versus the subepithelial dome. Over this side, the, the Green is the gated for the highest versus the white, the lower cells. But, the, but you can see that there aren't a lot of GFP cells enriching in the subepithelial dome. But if those green cells have GPI-35 in them, 
now you see that they have this predilection. So it does seem <clears throat> to be sufficient to promote uh, that movement um, into the subepithelial region, whereas there wasn't a significant effect of the empty factor. And so then the question was, okay, so I, I mentioned earlier CDC2s in the subepithelial dome help support IgA switch. Uh, so are we seeing an effect on that? Uh, and so Marco is comparing in the germinal center compartment with this set of markers in the payers patch, the control, litimate control versus knockout. And with the IgA stain, we can see that there is a partial reduction here, whereas Ig1 is trending in the opposite direction. And so while the effect is not huge, there is this significant across a bunch of mice uh, reduction in the IgA frequency of germinal center cells and the Ig1 is going in the other direction. And so this then uh, does play out into a reduced plasma cell, uh, IgA positive plasma cell compartment in both the Payas patch and the lamina propria. And, and if one looks in sections, two example control, two example knockout, and, and, and that's quantitated over here, you can see that there is this reduction in IgA positive CD138 positive plasma cells uh, in, in, the, in the villi. So um, that then also plays out to, to lower amounts of IgA coding commensal bacteria. So this is a, a B cell, you know, a, a skid mouse, so there shouldn't be any IgA. So that's the background, taking the feces and, and running the, them through the facts uh, after staining for any IgA that's bound to them. And you can see in the control mouse, this is the percent of label that we're, that we're getting with this sort of gating comparison. And in um, the knockout, it was variable. This is a bit of an extreme example, but as you can see summarized over here, there was this notable reduction in the amount of IgA coded commensal bacteria. So, so, so not only the plasma cells underrepresented, but the antibody um, is, is less effective at, at being binding the, the commensals. What about with a with a actual um, pathogen derived molecule? So cholera toxin uh, is a standard uh, important pathogen molecule to test with oral cavage. And um, the colors here represent different experiments, but there was a uh, reduction in that um, IgA response read out in ELISA against cholera toxin when this system is mutated. And so then um, the question is, well, We've got this receptor requirement on the CDC2, and we're arguing, or the model is that it's uh, favoring positioning in the subepithelial dome, where those cells can then support um, alpha beta 8 mediated activation, PGF beta to promote switch. But, but to for the receptor to get cells subepithelial dome, there needs to be a source of ligand in the subepithelial dome. And as I mentioned earlier, we'd obtain evidence that this uh, metabolite of serotonin, which is a tryptophan metabolite, um, sorry can have activity. We, we certainly don't mean to place as the only ligand on this receptor. It's rather a pleiotropic receptor, but we find um, bioactivity uh, with this molecule. And so we ask whether we can see uh, this, mo this molecule being produced in an appropriate location. And I also mentioned earlier that mast cells can be a source of serotonin and 5-HIA, the pathway down here. And, and you can see that this enzyme, tryptophan hydroxylase 1, is highly expressed in mast cells. CPA3 is, is a mast cell protease, uh, and so highly expressed. The monoamine oxidases, of which there are two, um, there is some expression as well, although you can see it is present in, in other cell types. And so the possibility that they might be a source of serotonin and perhaps its breakdown product or, or indirectly its breakdown product, we wanted to investigate. And we had already seen and could confirm that mast cells can produce and release 5-HIAA when you, when you activate them. These are mast cells from the peritoneum, but, but if they're wild type, they can release 5-HIAA um, measured in ELISA, but if they are from a CPA3 Cree, TPH1 flox, flox mouse, they, they can't make that metabolite. And so in a bioassay, using this type of mast cell, supernatant activated mast cells, we can see that there is a GPI35 dependent migration. This is a cell line that we've transduced with the vector um, relative to supernatant from TPH1 deficient mast cells. So with that in mind, we then ask, well, are there mast cells in the subepithelial dome? 
Now, some of you may know, um, and I, if Adrian's on the line, I know he, he knows a lot about mast but that, that there are uh, mast in the lamina propria for sure, but players patched up epithelial dome. So uh, to get a good look at that, we crossed CPA3 Cree to this reporter now to get red fluorescence in predominantly mast cells. And indeed, we could see this scattering of cells in the subepithelial dome that we're also labeling with these myeloid markers here. Uh, and so there, there they are. And um, so then we could say, okay, well, is mast cell TPH1 needed for the phenotypes I've just shown you that GPI35 contributes to? And indeed, there is a reduction in the payers patch CDC2 and a small, but again, uh, reproducible reduction in the IgA germinal center frequency, the IgA plasma cells in the payers patch, the IgA plasma cells in the small intestine that's quantitated over here. So, um, and also the fecal uh, IgA bacteria coding. And so this sort of uh, brings us to, to the, the summary model for this part, and that is layering on top of what I showed earlier. We can now say, and that there was small existing data, so we're confirming that one can detect mast cells in the subepithelial dome. And we're showing or providing evidence that their expression of TPH1 is important for these events. And we're inferring that that is because they're producing 5-HIAA, which they, they can produce, at least mast cells from other sites, uh, and engaging and recruiting GPI 35 positive CDC2s, both a recruitment and potentially a maintenance role. Um, and that can then do its work to promote the IgA switch. And I'm not sure they all go to the germinal center. I think some of the effects we're seeing on the IgA response are greater than on the germinal center IgA response. So some of this, this process might still be involved for some of the, the germinal center independent IgA uh, that's arising. So with that, I'm going to segue into a, another angle on B cell biology that uh, also reflects- Can I ask a question before you- yeah. Sure. Change? If you go back, to, like what happens if you activate mast cells? Do you like- yeah, Good question. No, and, and that's, so Marco's taken a lot of this with him to his lab, but we, we do uh, plan to look uh, a bit more uh, at that angle here. Um, we see that they have CD63 on them at some level, straight out of the payers patch as a surrogate um, of activity. So uh, what might be affecting the level of activity, we, you know, we, spec we can speculate, but we don't know. Is it really requiring a full-blown activity or is there some, you know, partial capacity to secrete. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to Adrian later, who I'm sure has thoughts on that. Cool, okay, thanks. Yeah, any other? Yeah, from the, from the chat, Jason, Adrian wants to know if you see a similar phenotype with mast cell deficient mice, like if you just do the CPA3 yeah. deficiency. Yeah, we have done a little of that. Um, it's complicated, but we do see the same uh, indications of reduced IgA. Other people have seen some other effects. So so I think we know mast cells are affecting other properties, but at least it appears consistent when analyzed in the same way um, in, in our hands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So s jumping um, from the, 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 the intestinal uh, mucosal surface to the systemic uh, surface, the, the spleen and its marginal zone, where uh, this organ, as many of you know, is important in, in our defense against bloodborne pathogens. And, and so um, you've, many of you have looked in the spleen, you know, you have your white pop cords, central T-zone, follicles around the T-zone. And then around that is this region where blood is being released, as these arrows are indicating, from in this specialized open circulation of the spleen and filtering through into the red pulp to return to circulation by venous sinuses. And um, that region, this marginal zone just outside the sinus is, is rich in these special B cells called marginal zone B cells that have important roles in responses to encapsulated bacteria uh, and various tin dependent polysaccharide antigens. And you can see we've stained for IgM and IgD, so marginal B cells are IgM high, IgD low. Uh, and then we've injected pan CD45 antibody that's PE labeled just two minutes before sacrifice. And so the yellow color is sort of the IgM high uh, blood exposed cells. And so you can see these blood exposed marginal B cells uh, 
there. And so, so, so we, we you know, this concept has been known for, for quite a while. And in rodent, it's very clear. And human, as some of you know, it's a bit more complicated. But we we believe there's a similar compartment of rapid exposed B cells that are going to contribute to rapid response to bloodborne pathogens. Um, and as I said earlier, we've we've found some of the requirements for positioning in this region in terms of S1PR1 and integrins, but there's still uh, a number of unknowns about how you organize a compartment, particularly in this unusual flow exposed uh, region. And so one of the things um, that we revisited was to image the um, this compartment intravitally uh, and ask about the encounters between red blood cells and marginal zone B cells. And so this is using an approach actually Tal Arnon uh, pioneered in the lab. She's got her own lab at, in Oxford in the UK now, but then Dan Liu picked up on uh, to, to use for this uh, new question. She actually uh, left a few months ago to start her lab um, at Westlake University uh, in, in China. And so um, what we do is we take C19 knockout mice that many of you know uh, have B cells but lack marginal zone B cells and transfer into them GFP positive B cells from just wild type mice, let them occupy the marginal zone niche over a period, uh, you, know, you have to be patient, which is always difficult for me, uh, of a couple of months. And then when you're ready, you put in some CTV B cells just to help locate the follicles, these will be follicular. Uh, and then the key thing here is we're gonna inject these red dye labeled red blood cells, and then do the intravital imaging. The mouse isn't quite looking like that when it's on the stage. But, um, and, and so these are the transferred GFP positive cells. And then you can see the majority of them have taken a C21 high, C23 low margin zone phenotype occupying that, that compartment. And, and then the transferred red blood cells to 119 positive, and the, the ones that we transferred at PKH26 bright are making up perhaps 2% of the total red blood cell compartment in the spleen uh, at, at that time. And so here's what the mouse is looking like on the stage, anesthetized um, with the spleen exposed, um, and then the objectives coming down on there. And we're having to scan a lot of the spleen because it's only in small locations along the whole length of the spleen that you'll find the margin zone within 200 microns uh, of the surface because the capsule is quite thick. So, so it takes uh, patience to find the right region. But with that, uh, Dan worked through it and was able to observe that the red blood cells are making frequent contact with marginal B cells. So let me, I think I lost the image. Let me just try and back up and hold this for a second. So, so we're looking at um, the green are the uh, marginal zone B cells predominantly. I mean, the, these are the transfer cells. The very bright ones out here are probably plasma cells that also developed in the transfer, but this region marginal zone uh, location and follicular B cells, uh, you can see through the projection view uh, more enriched in the deeper parts underneath. And then the red is, is predominantly red blood cells. There's some captured by phagocytes in the red pulp. But what we're then looking at is, is whether we can see um, interactions. And, and you see there's a lot of flow, red blood cells passing through, and, and Dan is going to highlight for you some example interactions between a red blood cell and a marginal zone B cell. Uh, and they're really you know, easy to find. Um, it's just that there's so much going on, you have to slow things down and rotate it in, in three-dimensional viewing to, to see it. But here, she, I think she's got another example um, and, and tracked a few of the red blood cells. And some of these she showed make contact with more than one margin B cell in their passage through this, um, th this fluid uh, zone. And so with that in mind, um, one wonders, let's see, uh, how the marginal B cells, you know, red blood cells are just being washed through this region. The marginal B cells are not, they're, they're resident in the spleen in, in rodents and they're not recirculating. And so we came into this actually from some other work we've been doing in the dendritic cells that some of you uh, may, may know about, but but I, I won't have time to take you through that, but but we had reason to think this this adhesion type G protein coupled receptor, ADGRE5, um, might be involved. And, and adhesion DPCIs have a long end terminus compared to like chemokine receptors or S1P receptors. There's, they have a functional domain in the end terminus that we'll talk more about. And then this one is, um, 
unlike the chemoattractant receptors, is coupling to G-alpha-13 containing heterotrimeric G proteins, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, tend to be migration inhibitory because they can directly activate Rho. Rho tends to antagonize RAC, and RAC is usually needed for pro-migratory uh, activity in, in lymphocytes. Uh, and so we said, well, is this system present in the Mars Muson B cell? And, and indeed, it's actually rather abundant in Mars Muson B cells compared to follicular, which are also quite positive. Uh, and so we looked in the mice we generated that lack um, C97, the gene name ADGRE5, and we could see that there was this partial reduction, but that was quite reproducible across a batch of mice. And uh, you can see that in sections um, as well, that the marginal zone fraction uh, is, is thinned out. And then we looked in these downstream uh, mutants lacking either the GF13 uh, gene or the ARHGF1, this, this GF, this active ARHGF13, saw a very similar marginal zone phenotype. And moreover, um, with the help of Jay Gardner here, uh, who set up a, a donor, a human donor system with, with cadavers looking in human spleen, we could see uh, the human spleen margin zone phenotype cells using uh, this uh, fairly simplistic gating scheme down here are high compared to the naive cells. So um, the, the, the deficiency that I'm showing you here, the question is what's the basis for that? And what we uh, could note is if we look in the blood, we didn't see any in the full knockout mice, but we speculated there might be some gradual loss going on and if we had a synchronized inhibition of the receptor, which we could do for blocking antibody, we might see them emerging into blood. And that was indeed um, what, what we could see. And so um, what this has led us to, sorry, jumping around here, is, is you know, to consider that this signal from this receptor is helping promote retention in the spleen. And so then we go through some work trying to understand the mechanism of action of, of the receptor. And I'm going to jump over some of that. This paper just came out. Um, and, it, this is um, fairly detailed, but but just to say that we showed that this, so this is what the receptor looks like, this ADGRE5, the E stands for EGF repeats in the N terminus. They, they, these adhesion GPCRs have this um, region that undergoes autoproteolysis during or after translation, and so they exist as two non-covalent peptides attached together. And that cleavage is often thought to be important. And indeed, we showed in this work over here that if you prevent that cleavage, the receptor cannot rescue the, the loss of function in vivo. Uh, so just keeping um, that in mind, the model is that beneath that cleavage site, there is a obscured tethered ligand. And when you do something, for example, to remove this, that can then behave as an agonist for the receptor. And so with keeping that in mind, the question is, what is regulating this receptor? It's there on the marginal zone B cell, but something's, something's regulating it. And CD55 is known to be a ligand for that EGF repeat region of CD97. And CD55 has is, is got these features. Some of you will know this is the decay accelerating factor of complement. But the key point here is it's a transmembrane protein on many cell types. Uh, this is showing uh, work from, from the Song group here that the structure of that complex uh, of the CD55 with the C97 EGF repeats has been determined and there's a large interaction surface. And so we look in CD55 knockout mice and indeed see they phenocopy the CD97 knockout. Um, and so CD55 is on uh, many cell types, but the cell we're speculating that may be relevant here is the red blood cell which indeed uh, is known and we're just confirming has good expression. And so what Dan could do is transfer wild type red blood cells into these knockout mice and indeed reverse the phenotype back over to a wild type state. And so to, to, as I said, details are in the recent paper, but um, what this is supporting is that the red blood cells being released in this open circulation in the spleen are making contact as I showed you, and I think we've got it again here, with marginal zone B cells. Keep in mind that we've only labeled 2% of the red blood cells here. So 50 times as many interactions going on as you're actually seeing. Uh, and those interactions are allowing the red blood cell CD55 to interact with the C97. And that's occurring for the most part in flow under shear stress, exerting a pulling force that's extracting, we, we believe, the N-terminal fragment, allowing insertion uh, of this tethered ligand 
and activation of this GF13 row pathway to promote retention. Now, I've got a couple more slides on mechanism here that I might uh, jump over some of this, I think, for time to get to the last uh, new piece um, since this just came out. But uh, what, what we've done here is to ask, is shear stress really involved in terminal domain extraction? And so in vitro, marginal B cells um, start with this level of surface C97. But if we uh, incubate them and just shake them on their own here, nothing changes for that C97. But if we add red blood cells uh, and do nothing, nothing changes. But if we add the red blood cells and shake, then we see this reduction here. Uh, and you could say, well, is that just removing the N-terminal region? So here we've got a GFP on the C-terminus, the GPCR domain. And that same experiment, uh, if we read out the GFP, there's, there's no change in this time frame. So we think that extraction really does occur, at least to some extent, and activate the receptor. Um, and, and, and evidence for that, um, it, it comes through uh, working with Ben Weiner, whose work, whose major project I'm actually going to come to next. But he um, had access to an optical C-trap instrument. And so uh, Dan put C97 into 293 cells. And then we brought some CD55 coated beads using the C-trap into contact with the cells. You just take one bead and make contact. And then you pull on it. And you look at two things in this case. One is we have a uh, row A activity reporter, this aniline uh, molecule that interacts with active row A, and see if that gets recruited as a sign of activation of row. And we measure the um, tether restoring force. So if you look down here, you can see that the row A reporter is not really doing too much. There's a bit of background at the membrane. But now the arrows he's pulling with a bead. And you can see that row A reporter is turning on at the pulling site. You can't see the bead, but, but he knows it's there under the microscope. Um, now, this is the mutant that cannot be cleaved and could not rescue function of C97 loss in vivo. Uh, and when we pull on that, um, he, the pulling's happening. Uh, we're really not seeing the row A. He, he, so he thought I'd better pull again, but, but still didn't, didn't see it. Uh, and then um, you can see over here that that row signal, presumably the row signal, is contributing to a greater pulling force, this tether restoring force that's being measured here, these peak and Newton measurements, that, that is greater with the wild state than with this, even though this is well expressed on the cell and interaction can be occurring, it's not exerting a retraction force. And so, so that, just to further summarize this part, uh, is, that, um, is that we've got red blood cell making contact and the C97 signal occurring, causing row activity and retraction and possibly improved integrant activity, but retention. But in C97 deficient setting, the contact's occurring, but there's no signal in C97, no row A activity causing retraction. Instead, the, the cell is oblivious and might keep moving in this direction and be flushed away. Now, I, I realize this image was a bit subtle, and, and um, a colleague suggested that maybe a, an analogy was needed. And so think of lemmings uh, just you know, blindly, mindlessly going over the edge uh, if you lack this pathway. But, but it, it, we, we think that, you know, this is supporting uh, and supporting improved function of the marginal zone. And indeed, if you lack this pathway, the ability to respond to at least a model T independent systemic antigen is um, diminished uh, in this setting. Okay, so I was going to use the last few minutes to um, introduce uh, a, a new piece of data, unless there's a question right there. Okay, I'll still leave time for some questions. Yeah. I have a quick one. So there, there's a lot of genetic disorders that change the number of like the ratio of M MZ to non MZ B cells. Have you guys considered looking at whether or not the C C97 axis is is disrupted in that? An example would be like the activated PI3K mutations. There's tons of like a big big increase in MZs. Um, that's a good suggestion. We we have not considered that in this regard. The one thing that we did, I'm really still aware of and more directly is CD55 deficient people that Mike Lenardo has studied. And of course, 
that they have complement over activity problems. So CD55 is for sure important broadly in complement regulation, and they have this protein losing enteropathy in the intestine due to leakiness from complement activity. So, so that's too extreme. But but what you're suggesting um, could be more realistic to think about whether this pathway and C97 activity is messed up. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, and maybe upstream regulators. Anyway, it's interesting. It's really cool. Yeah, no, certainly G proteins talking to PR3 kinase family members is, is, is something we need to think about. So, um, so, so as you can tell, I've, my group's been interested in GPCR function in the immune system for some time. And the emphasis has been on the GR for I and, and then the GR for 13 in particular. And we've touched on that uh, in, the, in the areas I've been going through. But, but we you know, shouldn't lose sight of the fact that heterotrimeric G proteins are heterotrimeric. Um, and in addition to this alpha subunit, which when you provide ligand, you go from the GDP to the GTP state, uh, and that has uh, various effectors that are important, such as the rho activity we just talked about. But, but the beta gamma, when they dissociate as part of this activation cascade, also have a bunch of effectors. And uh, any review will tell you that they can regulate um, phospholipases, adenylate cyclases, GRKs, ion channels, PR3 kinases, uh, uh, you know, various effectors. So um, we uh, thought it would be interesting uh, as part of looking at the G-alphas to also look at the G-betas. And this was a project led by Ben Weiner, who joined uh, my group and uh, Orion Weiner's group at UCSF, a joint postdoc. Orion is um, a cell biologist who studies cell migration and rho and small G proteins. Uh, but then um, after some time, um, in our labs, um, Ben had to move to New York uh, because his wife got placed there for residency. And so being a, a go-getter, he, he sort of thought, can we have a three-way uh, joint mentorship? And so we connected with Morgan Hughes, who some of you will know at Memorial Sloan Kettering, who's also interested in cell um, migration and, and more from a biophysical perspective, and, and took this, this interest with him uh, and then um, into Norman Hughes's environment, which sort of extended us beyond thinking about cell migration, our starting point, to thinking about also phagocytosis. And, and that will now be the emphasis in these few minutes. And so um, the approach we took was rather than working with lymphocytes in vitro, which is always a challenge to use this well-established cell line, myeloid cell line that can be made nicely into neutrophils. And, and Ben knocked out each of the five G-beta subunits independently and, and then tested them uh, in this assay of phagocytosis of the deformable polycrylamide microparticles, which some of you will, will know Julie Terrio uh, up there in Seattle, who, who uh, developed these, this platform, and you can control the size and the stiffness of the particles. These are quite large and they're fluorescently labeled, easy to read out phagocytosis. And what um, we were sort of predicting that things might go down as GPCI has been implicated in promoting phagocytosis. But what was really a standout was that G-beta-4 loss causes striking increase in phagocytic capability. And, and I mean, it, it, you know, when Ben's at the microscope, uh, it, it's amazing what he's seeing. Uh, you know, here's the large particle taken up by one HO60 neutrophil in the wild type, which is basically all they can manage. Um, but the G-beta-4s just love to keep eating. And so not uncommon to find them with three of these things inside. And so it's not just these particles. Um, you can see it uh, with bacteria, uh, with fungal spores, uh, with uh, ephrotosis of dead jerkat cells here. Uh, so this is a generalized increase in phagocytic capability. And so some of you will be thinking, what about phagocytosis of cancer cells, particularly if you opsonize them or block the don't eat me signal? And so Ben did, did that um, with the Ramos cell line mixed with his HO60 neutrophils. And you can see this is the wild type cells um, level of phagocytic activity in his particular time window. And um, the G beta 4 has you know, more activity at baseline. But then when you block CD47, you can see it's gone from, from this to this, or adding the C20 opsonizing and, and the CD47 blocking, um, it goes from this to this. So really um, you know, striking augmentations. So, so how, what, what's going on? And so, um, Ben has imaged um, this uh, behavior, and so you can see these stills here that the beta-4 knockout is able to do phagocytosis more rapidly, just to show you uh, that, that, that movie. Um, 
you can see the red is F tract and staining in the phagocyte, and this is the microparticle. And over here, you know, it has no trouble at all in eating that very quickly. Uh, and so the time of engulfment, you know, is sluggish for the wild type cell and just incredible for the knockout. And the um, efficiency thus of doing the phagocytosis is, of course, elevated in the knockout. Now, we had this, you know, a question about migration as one of the reasons we were initially knocking it out. And, and so Ben also set up a micro pipette assay, not so much used these days, but, but um, I'll show you a movie in a moment. But, but he could see the wild type cells migrating as expected for HL60 neutrophils. Knockout cells don't migrate as fast. They are migrating. Um, but then interestingly, when a wild type eats a bead, as is sort of known after phagocytosis, they, they have to stop and digest. Uh, and so they don't migrate much. And there's probably a good evolutionary benefit to that, to not spread the pathogen. But these cells actually speed up a little bit, if anything. And so let's let's take a look. And so the the, the purple is where the um, F met Luffy, the Kim Tracton is being is coming out, diffusing out. And you can see the wild type neutrophils migrating in, and the knockout ones too. But you'll notice a lot of them have these long tails. And let me just play a bit of that again. Uh, and that actually has been seen before if you mess with the, the row um, activation. So retraction of tails needs row activity and G beta four may be partly doing that, but that's still a work in progress. And now here we're looking at ones that have eaten um, a particle. The wild type uh, in red and the knockout in green, each of them have eaten uh, at least a particle. And you can see, or maybe, let me play that part again, that if you consider this is where the chemoattractant is most concentrated, that the green cells are managing to get into that region more effectively, even though they tend to migrate uh, more slowly. Here's one with a couple of particles uh, in it. Um, and so when Ben quantitates that, you can see the distance traveled after phagocytosis is greater for the knockout and ends up getting them further towards the chemoattractant. And so how are they, you know, what's the cell biology underlying this increased phagocytic capability? Well, when Ben um, did scanning EM, you can get this indication as more sort of ruffled membrane with these cells. He, he went one step further and did um, FibSem, uh, and I can show you his, his, uh, his movie of that, this focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, uh, really data intense. Uh, so you can only do small numbers of cells, but um, the green is, is representing where the plasma membrane is, and he was also looking at the lipid droplets inside the cells, but it allowed him to see that there was more uh, membrane uh, on these cells, as well as it turned out more lipid droplets. So the surface area is, is certainly larger, and there's uh, this interesting uh, increase in lipid droplets. So another way to look at the amount of membrane is to do osmotic shock, which is exactly what it sounds like, and measuring the volume after the shock. Um, and, and you can see that this is the, the amount of change for the wild type. Uh, and he's compared all the G betas here. And again, the G beta 4 has got this striking difference, having more capacity, uh, presumably more available plasma membrane. And so then using the C-trap I mentioned before, he's brought a bead, a con A bead that'll just bind any membrane surface. And he's pulling on it to measure the uh, tether force. And so wild type is uh, showing a good uh, tether force trying to pull back its membrane, but the knockout just sort of doesn't really care. He keeps pulling the membrane further and further away, uh, and there's a very minimal uh, retraction force. If he re rescues, puts back G beta 4, he can rescue that pulling force. And he did lipidomics and, and found that there was uh, increased ceramide and sphingomyelin in the G beta 4 deficient cells. And if you inhibit serine palmitol transferase, and this is done over some period of time, so this may be a differentiation effect of the G beta 4, we're not, not sure, but is reversing the increase in phagocytosis and the, the membrane tether force, uh, rescuing that membrane tether force. So finally, um, you know, is there an effect? of this uh, in vivo. And so here uh, we've made conditional G beta 4 knockout. This is actually just the full knockout at this point, uh, which are viable uh, and, and infected them with a fungal pathogen intratracheally, looking 18 hours later. Neutrophil recruitment is the same, but the G beta 4 knockout um, are eating more in, in these fungal particles. And um, as you might then expect, the CFU 
uh, I think this is out of the lung, uh, are uh, decreased, so more efficient clearance. But, it, but it's sort of a double-edged sword because while they can eat more, as we saw in vitro, they're, still, they're migrating more in this, uh, this state. And so there's risks of them getting away and disseminating. And indeed, if you look in the draining lymph node, you find more uh, phagocytosed aspergillus there. But in initial viability um, assessments for this infection, at least, this effect is what's winning out and the, the mice are surviving better when they lack this. But there may be other conditions for pathogens that can escape from the phagosome that this might be the, the, the outcome. So to summarize um, this, this uh, quick part, um, G-beta-4 dependent signaling is constraining plasma membrane abundance in neutrophils, and I didn't show you, but in macrophages, in humans and mice. G-beta-4 deficiency is increasing substantially phagocytic capacity, which is what this is trying to uh, highlight. And G-beta-4 is needed for crosstalk between phagocytosis and migration. And so we speculate there is membrane lipid sensing GPCRs functioning upstream of G-beta-4, containing heterotrimeric G proteins to maintain plasma membrane homeostasis. And so you lose this circuit here and you, you, you get dysregulated accumulation of membrane and plasma membrane uh, and, and this exaggerated phagocytic capacity. And, and there must be effectors downstream influencing sphincter lipid and probably other membrane biosynthesis pathways. So lots of important questions um, that, that Ben will be working on for, for uh, quite a while. And so to really finish off, um, you know, we've um, talked about three things uh, in the context of guidance activities for uh, immunity. GPI 35 is guiding myeloid cell recruitment and positioning in multiple contexts, roles in homeostatic and inflammatory settings. And this has led us to find evidence that mast cells can function as lymphoid tissue organizers. So we really think of it as their highly inflammatory roles, but, but I think this um, is an intriguing uh, layer of complexity for them. Uh, of course, as was asked, the, their activation requirements for this uh, is something we're really interested in. And then um, mechanosensing, uh, particularly of red blood cells, but potentially um, other cell types and, and um, external uh, factors uh, can provide positional information to immune cells. And this adhesion GPCR family, there's 33 family members, likely function with other mechanosensing systems to organize immune cell distribution and, 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 and function. And, and then, uh, as I just went over, the G-beta-4 signaling, presumably downstream of GPCRs that we're still working to characterize, promotes phagocyte membrane homeostasis and, and regulation of phagocytic capacity. And, and something that, that we're keen to look into is that this may there's, as some of you may know, there's uh, Charcot Marie tooth disease is, is a very common uh, neuropathy uh, with peripheral nerve demyelination. And, and uh, a small fraction of those patients have G beta 4 mutations, a bit, I think it's less than 1%. But really interesting to think how uh, what we're finding here might relate to that. And, and then, you know, whether we can leverage uh, regulation of agacetosis for, for therapeutic uh, purposes. So, sorry, I think I've really hit the hour. Um, uh, again, tried to thank key people along the way. Marco has driven all the GPI 35 work uh, and is now in Milan starting his lab. Um, several people made important contributions to, to that work. And then Dan Liu um, here is uh, did the C97 uh, work and is, is at Westlake, the, the first uh, English uh, official language university uh, in China. And Ben Weiner uh, here, who's uh, physically based uh, in Morgan's lab, but is joint with myself and Ryan Weiner in Morgan, uh, drove that, that last project. And of course, critical funding. And thank you for attention. And I will stop sharing. That's what this one is. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Definitely a tour de force as usual. Do you have a question, Mirda? Yes, I wanted to ask you a question about your marginal zone story, the CD97. Um, do you guys have any evidence which integrins it might be activating or affecting? I know it works very closely with a lot of different families of integrins. Yeah, no, I, we, we have shown some time ago that um, alpha-4, beta-1, and alpha-L, beta-2 are both important in marginal zone B cell retention. Uh, and, and there's been other data that agrees with that, certainly in, in the mouse. Uh, 
whether this pathway is activating those, we haven't been able to definitively show that. When we take marginal B cells out, they have high activity of those integrins. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like we need to set up this shear stress system to, to, to well, at least we'd need to add red blood cells to see that effect. When we do the adhesion assays, you do provide a kind of shear during the washing steps to measure that integrin activity. So I, I, I think it's whether rho is often upstream of integrins versus more downstream is still something I'm a little perplexed about. So I, mean, I, I think of it as downstream, but right, that, that's what most of the data is. But there's some indications, but I don't know how strong the data is that it can sometimes be upstream. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. Jason, you showed that not only margin zone cells express the receptor, but also follicular B cells too, right? And so are there, do you need a certain level of receptor expression to have this? Yeah. I, that's, that's right. I, so Jörg Harman, who did some of the nicest early work on C97, did show in his JI paper, you know, a decade or something ago, that any B cell in the blood is experiencing some removal of C97 in a shear stress dependent manner. So the follicular cells are probably being bombarded also in the blood with, with red blood cells. And, and it, I think there was also evidence that CD55 dependent uh, reduction. We haven't been able to show that has any effect on any parameter we've read out. Um, and that was his challenge too. He could see it, but he couldn't see what it was doing. So whether the higher level in the margin zone is really what's needed for it to impact the cell measurably that, that's where we are at the moment but but neutrophils have even more expression uh and so uh, i've you know i think hopefully dan will dissect out the possible impacts it's having on, on their behavior in certain tissue beds yeah, and and what about like developing b cells where they're definitely in yeah work? no that's a good question i should have a better mental image of when it's up regulating because the boma has an interesting shear uh, right. environment and Joao from my lab sort of been looking at some of that uh, back over in Yale. Um, I think we, you know, didn't see any indications even in mixed settings. And we have some of that data in the paper actually of, of the T1. T2. We didn't do all the subsets we should have done, but some of the transitional things didn't seem to be affected. But there were some hints in some some of them. So, you know, it could be something in there somewhere. And do you, like, did you look at like the marginal zone precursor versus the marginal zone cells and whether that had any impact on like? Probably not, not to your satisfaction, I suspect, but I, I, I've always had trouble getting a sufficiently sort of compelling gate, I think, on the marginal zone precursor probably, but, but I don't know that we can say we pulled that out. Yeah. But I, I think that we have bits of data that would, you know, certainly indicate as acting on the marginal zone cell whether it's also acting on the precursor, I don't think we can rule out. Yeah, it's always been an interesting, like, idea about how they, what's selecting them. Yeah, beyond, beyond sort of, the notch signal, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. yeah in addition to the not, not, It's interesting, right, because notch is also a shear stress or at least a, you know, a mechano-sensing system. Um, but I don't think people feel this kind of shear stress is needed, needed for that signal. But. Any other questions from the group? Can I can I show something about the the model for increasing phagocytosis and how you're thinking about that therapeutically, especially since this seems to be a developmental phenotype. So presumably you would have to block that pathway throughout development, but really what you would want to do is locally direct increased phagocytosis. Or right. Autoimmunity. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, we're we're in early days of of thinking about it. Uh, you know, I think if there is over phagocytic activity in a certain disease context, maybe one can try and diminish the overall activity over time. So that, that could still match up, but, um, increasing it. Yeah. I mean, one would think about engineering possibilities, but, but the time requirement will be a factor. I, I think, yeah, it, it could be multifaceted too. So. But the initial data suggests it's not an instant sort of influence, as you say. And what what's that you're thinking about in Charcot-Marie Tooth, how it would be impacting the disease? I, I didn't... There's evidence, um, in, not so much in looking at this subset of patients, but in a subset of elevated phagocytic activity contributing to the demyelination. 
And so the, the, there's already indications, not, not necessarily that a given phagocyte had more activity, but there was too much phagocytic activity. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been more macrophages or something. So we, we're, we're, you know, suggesting a, a new model, perhaps, of how even the given set of phagocytes could be too aggressive. Jason, is there a way you think of that you could you could mimic that effect in trans lo locally? The, the phagocytic effect? Yeah, the inhibition of GLP4 or GB4 or something. Uh, I mean, if we know what receptors are involved, then we can then we can yeah. get at that. But otherwise, these you know interaction surfaces, drugging them is is not trivial. Um, so. You know, once one goes off in the engineering direction, then one can think about other other possibilities, and, and we are we are starting to think about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. I mean, I don't think anybody's working on that. Well, the CD forty seven is the big thing, right? Yeah. But yeah. as some of you may know, the Gilead, you know, bought the company forty seven for a lot of money and took it through uh, big trials, and they failed uh, in terms of promoting increased phagocytic clearance of, uh, leukemia cells, uh, I forget which uh, AML, I think, I, I don't know the, the details haven't been made widely available, but, but that's a concern, but I think there's still heavy interest in using that pathway to, to block the don't eat me signal and get increased phagocytic capacity in, in cancer, at least. Jason, do you think you could use GPR 35 to bring a B cell into the gut effectively to uh, probably not yeah i think it's acting more locally than than that i don't know if we've done something that quite addresses that uh, but it's not like um but like, you used the overexpression in the that, right that was positioning them within that compartment right but i don't know we had any evidence it was bringing more into the gut it, 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 once you're in the gut can you re reposition i see uh, okay so, so if you had a way to get the B cells to the gut, you know, for instance, do an IP injection or whatever, and then they express GP35, maybe they would get to the, so, to the so, where the back, you know, into that subepithelial zone or whatever. That yeah, could be interesting. That's, that's right. Um, and, and whether this influences in the lamina propria more broadly, it's a possibility. Um, but, you know, I mean, CCR9 is so effective uh, at getting them probably to a similar location that that would be your first go-to chemotractant system. And then CCR6 is probably the next one. I think this is going to be more fine influences um, after that. Great. Well, thanks for a, a great... Yep. Good. Thank you. And I'll meeting with some people in a few minutes, I think. Right. So, yep. all right. And I'll see you a bit later, Dave. Yeah. Then I guess you sign off and sign back on. You know what you're doing. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll go ahead and sign out then. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Bye. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. That's great.